This is Paul McGuire, and you're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. Can America be changed? Can it be transformed? Some people think that America is over in terms of what Bible prophecy says. <clears throat> I don't believe that the Bible says at all that America is over. I don't think you can make a conclusive proof. You may have an opinion, but you can't make a conclusive proof that it is over for America. I believe that America is in a great spiritual battle, the greatest spiritual battle that it has ever been in since our nation was first settled by the Pilgrims and Puritans. That's true. And the stakes are very, very high. And in many respects, depending upon what data, what analysis you're looking at, the prognosis for the future of America uh, looks very grave, and it's a very negative perception. But having said that, there is an element that needs to be put in part of the equation, which I believe is a fundamental game changer. Now, we are approaching the election, and the election um, has been unlike any other election perhaps in the history of our nation, I would say by far. Uh, never before, and this is not a partisan statement, and I'm not, making, I'm not making an endorsement over one candidate or the other. I'm not making an endorsement over one party and the, over another. But there are some facts that need to be uh, looked at. Number one is, in uh, many years of observing political campaigns, and this is not just my opinion, this is the opinion of many highly respected news journalists and political analysts and historians, no one who, who is aware of what has transpired before in terms of uh, presidential elections can ever remember anything remotely that is happening um, like what is happening now. This is, this is, we're in totally uncharted territory. There has never been a, a presidential political election where the media have uh, colluded, organized, in lockstep to destroy, uh, bring down, and lie, <clears throat> and uh, uh, bury one of the uh, uh, two primary candidates running for election. There has never been a scenario that's played out like this. You can channel surf just about any time of day, the cable news networks, and there may be one network which has uh, a few exceptions in its programming, but even that network is very deceptive because it will bring you in, uh, you'll be... Uh, channel surfing, and you'll catch a, uh, a particular broadcaster on this, uh, what is considered by some to be a conservative network, you'll hear a show and you'll say, gee, that sounds like it's, it's fair reporting. It's not just a total attack uh, on a particular political candidate. But then as you continue watching the network, you discover that after you're hooked in, <clears throat> then the fists start flying. And they've hooked you in with the promise that you're going to get some objective reporting only to find out that this candidate is under an all-out assault. Or they're giving very, very softball coverage to the other candidate. Now, again, I'm not trying, I'm going uh, bending over backwards not to be partisan because this is bigger than partisan politics. This has to do with uh, the freedom our nation once once enjoyed. Because after this election cycle is over, if our media continues to be the kind of media that it is now, and right now the media, the mass media, all, all the major media, uh, including uh, the cable news networks, the regular networks, the uh, entertainment industry, um, all the talk shows, the radio programs, the print, the magazine, the internet media, uh, all of the media which is owned or controlled, what we would call the major media, is completely lining up um, 
in unison to, to tear down and destroy a particular candidate. And they will lie, and they will distort the news, and they will do anything they possibly can to bring this candidate down. And so we have to remember that when this election uh, season is over, and whoever wins the presidency, um, this fact will remain, that our media will have forever and ever been radically changed. And you will never be able to tune in to any major media broadcast and count on any uh, modicum of objectivity, of journalistic uh, ethics, of uh, objectivity, of journalistic standards. The media, whether they realize it or not, they have destroyed themselves because in, in their all-out <clears throat> Uh, charge to destroy one political candidate, they have sold their integrity down the river. And the amount of lying, the amount of deceit, the amount of uh, twisting of the truth, uh, the amount of uh, making one candidate look good no matter what, and then the other candidate do everything in your power to make that candidate look bad, um, it's not going to end with the election you're going to have a media which has uh, surrendered uh, its integrity. And there's no going back for that media, by the way. And it will be forever under suspicion by both people in America on the left side of spectrum and the right side of the spectrum. They will equally disdain the media. So this is the media's last hurrah. After this, it's over for them. And, you know... I was discussing this with a number of people about a year ago, and you can predict when you see certain broadcasters, entertainment personalities, news personalities talking, and you can predict uh, the fall of their ratings. Uh, you can predict with a fair amount of accuracy that they are losing their audience share. Because you see, whenever a journalist or a broadcaster gives themselves over to being a total propagandist, a total mouthpiece for one politician or another, whether it's a right-wing politician or a left-wing politician, they, they um, have kissed their credibility goodbye, and nobody's going to take them seriously any longer. So we had one particular news network, cable news network, CNN. I will name CNN uh, because it's important to, to use as an object lesson. CNN, ever since uh, the uh, primaries were essentially over and the Republicans uh, settled in on their candidate, uh, Donald Trump, and the Democrats settled in on their candidate, Hillary Clinton, from that moment forward, CNN has been in the 24-7 attack mode of Donald Trump. I mean, anytime you turn on CNN, you're going to see a feeding frenzy of starving sharks uh, analyzing every microscopic piece of information about Donald Trump in the hope of ripping him to shreds. And what you see is that Donald Trump will give a speech somewhere, or he, he will appear at a church or a rally or a press conference. And I'm talking about within three seconds after CNN cuts away from the news coverage at the rally or whatever, and they go back into the studio within three seconds, they are in the full-on attack mode against Trump to rip him to shreds, to microanalyze every, every uh, statement, every nuance, every little thing about his presentation in an attempt to discredit him, rip him to shreds, and to promote another candidate. Now, they always play this game on CNN where you have <clears throat> the host of the program, the uh, major guests of the program, are all in an alliance to, to rip Trump to shreds. But then they'll have a token conservative and maybe two. And so you'll have a, a ratio of about one or two token conservatives. One of the conservatives is usually incredibly weak. And so that person doesn't even count. And this is done on purpose. And then one may be uh, 
uh, fairly effective. So you so you have one uh, conservative uh, against four, and if you include the the un hidden bias of the host, you'll have one conservative uh, guest against five uh, high-powered guests who were there to rip uh, Trump to shreds. And it's not fair, and it's and all the rules of debating and discussion are thrown out the window, and it's a feeding frenzy. And it's disgusting. It's obscene. Because it's not, it, there's no journalistic integrity. It's, it's a complete whoring out of uh, the media. They have prostituted themselves. And you can go through the channels. It's always the same on CNN. So it didn't surprise me because I said to uh, a number of people that I was talking to, I said that there's no way, uh, given the popularity with Donald Trump in the public, that CNN can do this 24-7 attack mode on uh, Donald Trump and then... Uh, uh, have any ratings. I said they'll, they will plummet in the ratings. Their, their audience will walk from them because uh, they are offending a huge percentage of their viewers because CNN had been successful in winning over a large number of viewers uh, during the primaries uh, because during the primaries for a long period of time, Fox News Network was in the attack mode against Trump. They were trying to bring him down. And they were uh, promoting uh, other uh, Republican candidates. And in the process, a huge percentage of uh, Trump supporters stopped watching Fox and they went over to CNN. So CNN won this huge uh, uh, number of new viewers. But as soon as the primaries were over, CNN turned on a dime because you see, None of these networks, whether it's MSNBC, whether it's CNN, whether it's Fox, whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, or whoever they are, they're not, they don't operate their networks like a normal business enterprise. It's not, they're not playing by the normal rules of business, which is you produce and develop programming which will attract a, a large audience so you can have large advertising revenues. No, this has nothing to do about business. This is totally ideology-driven. They are, have been in, uh, instructed to bury Trump, even uh, at the cost of losing uh, countless millions of dollars in advertising revenue, even at the expense of crashing in the ratings, which they have. And there are countless uh, television networks that are doing the same thing. It's not about, they're not running this about... Um, a business model for media. They're running it. It's ideology driven. And the people that own these networks, the globalist elite, for example, who own these networks, have other networks where they can pull in their profits from to subsidize a partisan attack on certain candidates and parties and platforms. So it wasn't a surprise to me that CNN went from number two of cable news networks to number nine, which is which essentially is going into the garbage dump of ratings. Their ratings, CNN's ratings have become so minuscule, they're at the bottom of the barrel. They've plummeted. Number nine is like nothing. It's like a tiny audience. And it's so tiny that the head of uh, uh, CNN, if you look carefully at their, at their news lineup, you will see that the head of CNN is more and more replacing uh, what was usually the time period for news programs on CNN. He's gutting those shows or deciding not to air them. And instead, he is airing uh, sensationalistic documentary specials and films, like either on ma mass murders or global warming or this criminal or that criminal. He is, the head of CNN is, is uh, airing like tabloid, sensationalistic uh, documentaries, and he's not airing the news programs. Why? Why is he doing that? Because these uh, tabloid, journalistic style uh, documentaries, one the other day was on this weird sex cult, 
Now that replaced some big news show. Those shows bring in far bigger audiences, far bigger ratings, and they can sell far uh, bigger advertising revenues to these weird tabloid-style documentaries than they can to their news division. And why is that? Because nobody wants to w watch a news division which has no uh, integrity, which is just a, a prostitution ring to attack uh, one particular candidate. So CNN is crashing and will continue to crash and continue to stay at the bottom of the barrel uh, unless they change and decide to have some integrity. But I, I don't think that's going to happen. And so I think you're going to see a wave of uh, many news outlets, many Internet news sites. You know, there's a reason why the New York Times is collapsing before our very eyes. There's a reason why these once prestigious uh, flagship uh, news programs on, on uh, CBS and NBC and ABC there's a reason why many of these giant uh, uh, news organizations like the Huffington Post and others that have a liberal slant are all collapsing in terms of ratings, which means they're collapsing financially. Now, they may be making money, for example, with these networks in their entertainment divisions, but their news divisions are plummeting because, because the average American uh, wants journalistic integrity. They want the truth, and they don't want uh, to watch a, uh, um, an attack uh, that is so transparent. So th this is a dynamic that's going on. Now, the other thing is that um, <clears throat> the unfairness is, is staggering. So, for example, Trump was speaking at an African-American church and as he was speaking at this African-American church the other day, um, you saw that an interesting thing happened. While uh, Trump was being praised by the African-American African uh, pastor, Bishop Wayne T. Jackson in Detroit, because, he was being because Trump was being praised by an African-American bishop, Wayne T. Uh, Jackson in Detroit, the Reuters uh, network cameraman and director were caught uh, uh, cut, deliberately cutting off and turning off the cameras. The minute that the African-American pastor began to praise Trump, the director ordered the cameraman to shut off the camera. In fact, the words were, according to one news source, the cameraman is speaking to the uh, director at Reuters saying, uh, he, because he wants to have integrity, so he's saying, I'm shooting this. I don't care what they say, I'll take a demotion for this. You? He was asking the director. And the director says, quote, shut it down, says the director, followed by another voice asking, shut it down. Yes, Michael, do it, orders the director. So um, then they had, we, we, when we hear the words blackout and the camera shakes before the live feed is cut. So the Reuters uh, uh, news network, which was the main primary video feed for all the other networks uh, and all the other news organizations were feeding off this Reuters primary video feed with the black pastor praising uh, Trump. Uh, it shut down all the other uh, all the other networks, which were quite a few. Uh, the, the viewers were just deprived of uh, uh, basic honesty in the fact that the African American pastor and the church were enthusiastic about Trump. They didn't want their audience to see that. You see, that's that's George Orwell's. Uh, media like out of 1984. That's Big Brother media. That's not honesty. That's like, you know, propaganda. That's like what the Nazis and the Third Reich did. That's what like Stalin did in communist Russia. It's not, that's not freedom of the press. That's, this is a corporate controlled media owned by the elite following orders. And we could go, you know, we could offer up hundreds of examples. Now, 
it just doesn't uh, work in uh, reference to uh, the attack mode for uh, Trump. This is a far bigger issue than this. Uh, there are many uh, instances with Democrats or Democratic presidential candidates where <clears throat> certain news organizations will uh, uh, decide to attack the Democratic candidates or the Democratic Party in uh, unfairness and in uh, uh, um, selectively editing uh, capturing certain footage that makes a Democratic presidential candidate look bad, uh, taking it out of context. Um, so it, it happens on both sides. However, it, it, I believe it could be fairly said that in this political, uh, this particular political cycle, um, the, the media is overwhelmingly uh, anti-Trump, and that's because the globalist elite, which own the media, just six corporations own the media, uh, have decided to back uh, the Democratic candidate and not to back uh, Trump. Now, but let's take other issues that are of concerns to both liberals and conservatives. Let's take issues that are of high concern to leftists and uh, people that would be on the right. Let's take issues that are of very high concern to progressives and conservatives. <laughs> Both progressives, leftists, Democrats, and conservatives and Republicans and people on the right uh, share, for the most part, uh, a distrust of the big pharmaceutical companies, and they believe that they're those people that are somewhat educated believe that they're being poisoned by the big pharmaceutical companies, and that the big pharmaceutical companies are suppressing uh, the truth, that they're not allowing herbal alternatives and vitamins and nutrients uh, to to news about their positive benefits to come out. They, they, they don't want people taking herbs and nutrients and vitamins and eating certain things in order to prevent and cure diseases. Uh, big pharmaceutical companies have a hidden agenda to sell drugs, even if those drugs kill people, as long as they can make a profit. And there is a consensus or an agreement on those on the left and those on the right, those that are Republican, those that are Democrat, regarding this, and they're equally concerned. But when you turn on the, 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 all the media, including, by the way, the conservative media, because so many of these media organizations rely on ad after ad, commercial after commercial, where they're promoting a drug. I mean, how many times if you turn on television, it's one drug, one pharmaceutical after another being sold, and it becomes, like, ridiculous. First of all, when you listen to the announcers speak in a very fast voice about all the deathly uh, harmful side effects of the medication that should terrify you. But second, secondarily, um, this, uh, you're, you're being bombarded with ads that are designed to get people to take a drug for, uh, drug for everything. And on top of that, the, the, the advertising strategy is that the ad companies and the pharmaceutical companies conspire and create the dozens and dozens of brand new names for diseases we've never heard of. So you could take a common ailment like, like bad breath or whatever, and now it has a medical term. It has now become a medical disease, and, and now they want to sell you a prescription drug to deal with something that normally didn't take a prescription drug. So here you see, again, the, the whoring out of the media. And then you take uh, GMOs, gen genetically modified organisms, genetically modified foods. This is a huge concern uh, of people on the right and the left, conservatives, liberals, Democrats, and Republicans alike. They want, they, they want to eat uh, <clears throat> fruits, vegetables, and foods which are not uh, that, that have not come from GMOs or genetically modified organisms. They want organic food because they don't want to eat an avocado or uh, 
an orange or whatever that has been genetically modified. They don't feel safe. They believe there's a, there's a, a, a cause and effect of, of bad health with these things. But, you, but the power, the sheer enormous financial power and political clout of these GMO food companies have, uh, they control the government regulatory agencies, uh, they control the media, they do, they do not allow television news to do documentaries uh, exposing the dangers of GMO foods and uh, the big food industry. It's completely censored. So once again, the media is uh, completely not on the side of truth. It has whored itself out completely. It's prostituted itself. And you have to really spell it out for what it really is. The six corporations that control the mass media, they are quite content to sell ads for products made of uh, uh, unhealthy ingredients which cause disease and kill people. And so these networks and their executives have no problem with their conscience doing commercial after commercial, ad after ad, uh, promoting things either by the big pharmaceutical companies or the big food companies that are killing people, that are causing diseases. And so people are dying. You know, and again, the left and the right, those people that are, you know, still able to think, um, there's a reason why there's an unprecedented epidemic of diabetes, of cardiovascular problems, of cancers, and many, many other diseases, autism, uh, depression, and we could go on and on and on. Why are all these things happening? I mean, you know, people need to wake up. They have been this, this con about fighting and raising money for a cure for cancer or for a cure for diabetes or a cure for cardiovascular or whatever it is. It's a joke. It's a joke. Many of the companies that, that uh, uh, raise money to find a cure for these diseases in partnership with the pharmaceutical companies and the big food companies, their primary business is to find a cure. But they don't want to really find a cure because if they really found a cure, then that fundraising entity, which is dedicated to finding a cure for cancer or whatever the disease is, and then the pharmaceutical company and the food companies would be out of business. They make this the sad, dirty, naked, cruel truth is that these companies are soulless and they make hundreds of billions of dollars in profits off make, making sure people are sick and uh, they don't want them healthy. They don't want a cure. Now, that's very, very hard for a lot of people to believe. But that's because they're in denial of reality. So again, you see the news media prostituting itself, whoring itself out, selling ads. And again, they will not do serious news reporting, investigative reporting on anything <clears throat> that um, uh, buys advertising. They're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. So these... Uh, these, you know, all these smiling journalists that you love and all that stuff, they're complicit in this. And so what is going to happen is this particular election is kind of like, it's a watershed moment because the distortion, the lies uh, have never been more egregious. And we've reached a point of no return. Nobody's going to believe the media after this. They, they weren't believing the media anyway. The ratings of, of media people in terms of their integrity or whether or not they lied. I mean, the, the statistical ratings of people in, in journalism. Why do you think nobody buys the New York Times and all the rest of these papers? They're falling apart. Is it because nobody reads uh, newspapers? No, they don't want to read the lies and the propaganda and, 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 and the fictional pieces that, that you know, are, are peddled as objective news. So 
so this is a serious thing because freedom of the press is uh, been undermined by corporatism, corporate America. And the reality is, is all the media, the major media, are owned by just six corporations. And who are these six corporations? Who are they? Well, they happen to be the same international banking families. They happen to be the same uh, financial institutions and uh, wealthy individuals that own, for example, the Federal Reserve and the international banking system. What we're looking at is the globalist elite has total control of the global media in every nation, total control of uh, big pharmaceutical companies, total control of the big food companies, total control of all the media and the reporting. The globalist elite is, is composed of an elite that rules this nation and rules the world uh, as kind of a shadow government. And, and there's a growing awareness that the shadow government is not a mythology, it's real. There's a growing awareness that the global elite uh, really does exist and it's not a conspiracy theory. And um, we're reaching a tipping point because there is no trust in these. In you now have no trust by the average American, not that you had a whole lot of trust before, but now you have no trust uh, from the average of American, no matter what race, um, African American and uh, Hispanic and, and white and other racial and ethnic groups, they don't trust the, pol the politicians, they don't trust the media, because they know they're being lied to. So uh, what you have here is a paradigm shift People are recognizing that we live in a nation which is uh, like George Orwell's 1984. There's a total control grid over this nation. Now, still, with all these people waking up, you still have a huge percentage of people in America, probably the largest, larger percentage, and in Europe and in other places, who are so brainwashed that they're in a trance state, and that they're in a state of total denial about everything I just discussed. These are the people that are the, they're, they're the zombies. They're the walking dead. And uh, these institutions and politicians and the media and pharmaceutical companies and the uh, uh, food conglomerates prey upon the uh, vast number, the tens of millions of Americans and people from other nations that are, that are like zombies. They're the walking dead. They're in a trance state. They can't see the obvious. So what is going to happen here? Well, no matter who wins this uh, particular election, things will never be the same <clears throat> in politics because uh, stuff has been exposed big time. I mean, stuff that is unprecedented has been exposed. The light has shined on some deep darkness, deep darkness, and Americans have had it because they realize there's two sets of rules, one, sets of, one set of rules for them and one set of rules for the powerful. And then the other thing is they, they see the lies and the, uh, just the incredible lying that goes on uh, by the media and by politicians and by the financial institutions, et cetera, et cetera. So where, where, where is all this headed? Well, where it's headed is um, when the election is over, uh, it, can't, it won't go back to normal. Uh, the, the media will not be able to earn its trust back. It won't. You'll, you'll have to have uh, new media rising and, of course, the new media will be most likely uh, financed by the old media, and they'll try to disguise it. So they'll come up with new names for new media outlets pretending to be, uh, pretending to be independent. And it will fool some people, but the smart people will see right through it. Now, the other thing is as we approach this election, uh, to be blunt, all hell is going to break loose. There will be riots. 
All this talk about the rigging of voting machines or the rigging of the election uh, becomes almost absurd. The fact of the matter is, in all the key battleground uh, states, every electronic uh, voting machine can be easily hacked into. So every voting machine, which is electronic, is easily hackable, which means you can't count on uh, their accounts being accurate. They can be rigged easily and controlled from an external position, uh, as well as any other place electronic voting machines are uh, used. The voting machine companies, and one of the biggest voting machine companies is headquartered in Spain. And it, is, it has been alleged, and I don't know for sure, but I can only talk about what, it is, what has been alleged, is that George Soros, the super billionaire, who, who is using his vast billions to, to uh, transform America into his vision of America, not the people's vision, <clears throat> that he has been or is a primary stockholder in these voting machine companies. Now, why would George Soros be a primary stockholder in the voting machine companies? Because he wants to rig the elections. And all this talk about the Russians rigging the, the elections is... is uh, <laughs> It's like ludicrous. The, the fear should not be the Russians rigging the elections. Fear should be people in America rigging elections. I think it was Lenin, the communist revolutionary, who made the statement, it doesn't matter uh, how many people vote for this candidate or that candidate. It doesn't matter who, win, who wins the election. The communist revolutionary Lenin said, the only thing that matters is who counts the votes. And what he was implying is the elections are theater. The elections are just a big show. What really matters is who has the power to count the votes, because they're the people that will control what kind of government you have. So we're in a very serious, we're in a very serious place. Now, this is all heavy stuff. And you should be aware of it <clears throat> and the dynamics of it, including the six corporations that control uh, the media, the pharmaceutical companies, and the uh, uh, big food conglomerates, the total control that they exercise. You know, you turn on these uh, uh, late night comedy shows, and I, I almost never watch late night comedy shows, but I have watched them in the last week or two. And um, it is amazing to me that all these superstar late-night comedians um, who, who are on all the basic major networks and then they have the big comedy shows with the bands and the jokes and the movie star guests, the vast majority of them are shills for one particular political candidate and even have that candidate on their program. And why is that? Because they... Their networks are controlled by the global elite, and that's that the global elite want to put in the candidate. This should be so obvious to people, but it's not. If all the global elite is rallying behind a particular candidate, it's because they know that that candidate is going to serve the interests of the global elite. And the global elite are the people that own the big Wall Street uh, uh Financial firms, they own the international banks, they own the multinational corporations. The global elite are going to uh, support uh, those politicians that are going to take care of their interests. And a politician who attempts to represent the interests of the we, the people, is not going to get the support of the global elite. That should be fairly obvious, but I guess it's not. So, we live in a time like George Orwell's novel, 1984, with an Orwellian media and uh, rigging through sophisticated algorithms, uh, messages on Facebook and social media, and you have things like trolls uh, changing public opinion in chat rooms, you have social bots changing opinions in, in chat rooms. you got all this stuff going on. And the outcome here is, you know, if America continues to hemorrhage jobs, and it is hemorrhaging them very badly, 
And if our cities are going to turn into more like Detroit, where the manufacturing industries of the auto industries left, and Detroit, all the good paying jobs left Detroit, and the manufacturing left Detroit, and Detroit is like, with with a few exceptions, is a is a ghetto. It's like something out of the movie RoboCop. And this is happening all across America, this kind of trend. But the politicians don't seem to care. And by the way, the Republican establishment, you know, um, the Republican establishment is just as much a part of the globalist elite as the uh, uh, democratic establishment that they like to criticize. I mean, you look at the Bush family, uh, the first George Bush, and he openly was an advocate of the New World Order, and he was openly an advocate of trade treaties, and he was a huge spokesperson for the New World Order. Now, that tells you a lot about him, globalist elite. And then you have... uh, um, other candidates, <clears throat> uh, George Bush Jr., um, you know, his silence uh, says everything. There's a man who, who claims to have had a born-again prayer, prayer with Billy Graham, yet he remains totally silent on all the important issues of our day. Now, what does that tell you about his character It tells you he doesn't have uh, a conscience and compassion for our nation. Because if he had compassion and a conscience for our nation, if he had concern for where our nation was going, he would put aside his own personal desire to be left alone. And he would speak up as a man of conscience to, to help guide our nation in the right direction. But no, he, he, he hides out. And I would suggest to you that that is uh, selfishness of the highest degree. Jeb Bush and these other political candidates who promised to support whoever was elected, but now they're silent and they refuse to support Trump. Now, admittedly, Trump uh, spoke to them in in an uncalled for manner, in a very uh, rude manner, and hit below the belt. So, in a sense, uh, Trump uh, sowed uh, some pretty, pretty bad stuff among his uh, uh, other Republican presidential candidates. I mean, he dished that out. There's no way of ignoring that. But you have to ask the question, if these other candidates like Rubio and Cruz and Jeb Bush and Kasich and, and uh, Carly Fiorina and others... If they were so concerned about America as they say, then wouldn't you, if you were in their position, uh, lay down your personal hurt, even though you uh, may have every right to be angered by, by how you were treated? But wouldn't you, for the sake of the good of the country, lay aside your personal, uh, uh, hurt feelings? And, and speak out for what you believe is the most important thing for our country? Of course you would. But you see these individuals are silent. And I would suggest to you that their silence is an indication of uh, a, selfishness, a selfishness that is unparalleled. And if you think that these men and women are, are people of virtue, uh, you are sadly mistaken. They are completely self-centered people. Completely self-centered because the only thing they're thinking about is their themselves and their personal hurt. And that's who they are. They are part of the globalist elite, by the way. If they weren't part of the globalist elite, then they would, they would be doing something. So all of these things uh, are converging <clears throat> on our nation. Now, we can expect to see riots as we get closer to the election. We can expect to see more scandals being dug up on on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, You're going to see more stuff on Hillary. You're going to see stuff on Trump. 
You're going to see more accusations about um, uh, rigging the election. You're going to see potentially overtures uh, to try to uh, stop the election and declare, let's say, a national state of emergency. And uh, the election is postponed for the good of the country because one candidate is not deemed, uh, uh, you know, intellectually uh, sound to to uh, be president, and the other candidate has serious health issues, which might incapa- incapacitate that candidate from uh, filling her office. So you have the potential of uh, uh, some kind of intervention where the election is postponed and we have a continuation or third term by our existing president. That's a very real possibility. Then you have um, the election day itself and uh, who counts the votes. And either way it plays out, you're going to have riots, you're going to have demonstrations, and you're going to have accusations that somebody cheated and that the voting machines were rigged uh, either in favor of this candidate or that candidate. And you can expect to see a mobilization of riots and demonstrations and all kinds of stuff. So uh, you're also, uh, because both of these political candidates have such extremely high uh, negatives, you're going to see uh, tremendous resistance towards either of them uh, inside Washington, D.C. in terms of getting anything done. Tremendous resistance, people speaking out against them, and you're going to have uh, all kinds of chaos. And uh, then you're going to see the trade treaties uh, either push through uh, a lame duck Congress, and the trade treaties will continue to bury American jobs, bury uh, American manufacturing, and bury uh, high-paying wages uh, that will profit the globalist elite. So the trade treaty is going to go through because the people that control the nation, which are the globalist elite, want it to go through. And then you're going to see... uh, uh, a super crisis with health care because the health the current health care plan is astronomically expensive and uh, the the premiums and the fees that have to be paid by the middle class and others who are paying for them are so high that it's going to bankrupt the middle class and it, it there's going to be tremendous chaos in the economic sphere because it, it is this this health care is completely unaffordable in a slow economy, and it's going to provoke an economic crisis along with the other factors. And so you're going to have an economic crisis of one sort or another. Now, um, these are just a few of the things that are going to happen. And this is why I wrote my book, uh, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, and why I wrote, or not wrote, why I produced the DVD set to go along with it, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, because I wanted to focus in on the years 2016-2017 as being the important, most important years in our nation's history, and that uh, um, we need to focus in on what's happening. And I discuss in the book and the DVD, and it really is essential reading if you want to get up to speed, um, what exactly what is happening with our economy, what exactly what's happening with the trade treaties, exactly what are the ambitions and game plans of the globalist elite, and what does this all mean for the future of America, because the future of America, whether we like to admit it or not, is sliding down the slippery slope of a soft totalitarianism um, where our freedoms are being increasingly eroded. And uh, that's not good. 
Now, I wrote A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017 in, in the four DVD set to explain to people, uh, to get them up to speed, to ed educate them as to what is happening, why it's happening, who is the globalist financial elite, how do they interface with the Illuminati, which is a real organization. And uh, I expose the debt slavery system uh, that is being employed right now. And most importantly, I give answers uh, to God's people on how they can be overcomers and how they can change the direction of America if they will stop relying on their own wisdom, intellect, or government, or, or you know, human resources to solve the problem. It's not, that, it's not that all of those things don't have a place. All of those things have a place. All of those things are necessary, but none of those things are supposed to be our God. And what made America great is that it was founded by pilgrims and Puritans who were strong Bible-believing Christians who believed that um, God was their source, capital S. They didn't believe it was their ingenuity, their ability to farm, uh, their ability to defend themselves. They didn't believe that their resources consisted of how smart they were. The Pilgrims and Puritans had a fundamental belief that God was their source, capital S. So whenever anything happened to them, and lots of things happened to them that were catastrophic. They had diseases that almost killed their entire population. <clears throat> they were attacked and they were almost wiped out. Uh, they uh, <clears throat> had all kinds of uh, weather problems and social problems that threatened to destroy uh, their early settlements. But in every one of these cases, the Pilgrims and Puritans did something that was completely unique and different than uh, what Christians in our society do today and have been doing for the last hundred years. And I'll explain it very simple. simply. The Pilgrims and Puritans, as I explain in the Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, entered into a covenant with God <clears throat> based on the, co the covenant that uh, the ancient uh, children of Israel made through God, through Moses, which is uh, summarized in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where it lists the blessings and the curses that would come from God, and their detailed lists of blessings and curses that are economic. They have to do with military victory. They have to do with health. They have to do with productivity of crops. They have to do with uh, prosperity and all kinds of things. So they're very detailed promises, either on the side of God blessing them or the side of God cursing them. But it was all contingent upon whether or not they were going to worship God as God or worship idols. And it was all contingent as to whether or not they were going to diligently hearken uh, to obey the voice of the Lord God, which means they were going to read God's word and do it diligently. Now, they understood, the children of Israel, that if they did those things properly and obeyed God, God would supernaturally release blessing on all the quantitative, measurable aspects of economics, uh, agriculture, military victories, health, uh, the society, and so on and so forth. God's supernatural power manifested itself in blessing, tremendous blessing, upon the children of Israel that was so amazing that the pagan nations around Israel would lift their heads up in astonishment as they saw the children of Israel prospering at every dimension, and it glorified God. And the, the, the pagan nations attributed the success and prosperity of ancient Israel to <clears throat> the God of Israel. Even they understood it. 
But, you see, they went to God as their source. So what would happen is when things were going bad for the pilgrims and Puritans, uh, they would immediately call a solemn assembly. The, the, the Christian leaders would call a solemn assembly. They would have meetings 24-7. <clears throat> they would cry out to God. They would fast. They would pray. They would repent. They would ask for God's supernatural intervention. They did not play church, which is the norm in America. The norm in America is to play church. That's why nothing happens. But they didn't play church. They laid hold of God. They did what Jesus did, even though Jesus had not yet come. Jesus said, occupy until I come, or do business until I come. They did kingdom business. And God supernaturally would pour out his blessing upon them in response to their repentance and fasting and intercessory prayer, which they would keep up until uh, things began to change. Now, things did change, and America became the most prosperous nation on planet Earth and the nation with the most prosperous economy and the nation with the most freedom for the most people. America... Uh, was the fountainhead of all those blessings, but those blessings are rooted in the right relationship that the people of God had with their God. Now, conversely, in today's society and during the last 100 years, the church in America, first of all, is in denial of the problems that are all around it. Secondly, the church looks to everything but God to solve the problem. They look to government. The average Christian looks to government. The average Christian leader looks to government, or <clears throat> medical science, or science, or technology, or our military, or uh, America's economic strength. The average Christian in America, and the average Christian leader in America, looks at everything but God Almighty to be their source. And that is why... America is uh, deteriorating and and in, into uh, going into an eclipse, and we're losing jobs. We're being overrun. We're, we we have problems in every sector and quarter of our nation. Our nation is a nation in crisis, a crisis, and it is because the people of God, the body of Christ, and the Christian leaders are not doing what the pilgrims and Puritans did. In fact, they are worshiping idols in the sense that who they, who they look to to be their God is not the real God of the Bible. They are looking to man and man's government to solve the economic problems, the terrorism problems, <clears throat> the economic problems, the social problems. The church and the average Christian is looking to human institutions, human wisdom, human resources, and all of those become idols. So, in effect, the Christian church in America is worshiping idols, the gods of personal peace and prosperity instead of the true God. And also, uh, in violation of Deuteronomy 28, the Average Christian is not hearkening diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And so we're under a curse, <clears throat> plain and simple. Now, um, <clears throat> this election is, is a microcosm of that curse, by the way. And we pray that God will give us leaders that are righteous and godly. We pray that. But most Christians don't vote, which is another evidence of uh, uh, heretical Bible teaching, uh, leadership that is not walking with God, and Christians that are not walking with God. But the root problem, the root problem in America is not government. The root, root problem in America is not this politician over here. It's not this politician over there. And the root problem in America is not this party. <coughs> Or that party. The root problem in America is spiritual. The people of God are not in a right relationship with the Holy God. They have violated his commandments. And when the people of God in America will finally decide, and I pray that they will, when they decide 
that they will heed the watchman, the warning of the watchman, that they will he heed the blowing of the shofar, where the watchman gets up on, on a tower and he can see the enemy coming in uh, from a distance and the enemy is planning to destroy and slaughter the people of God. But the faithful watchman gets into the tower, blows a trumpet, and communicates to the people of God that their lives are in danger. They need to rouse themselves and prepare to defend themselves against an advancing enemy. If the people of God obey the watchman's warning, they are protected. And uh, the watchman is blessed by God. Now, if the watchman fails to... Uh, see the enemy coming, if the watchman fails to warn uh, what is going to happen and the, ch the children of God are slaughtered, then the, then, then the holy God will hold that watchman accountable for the blood of the people. But if the people of God hear the, the trumpet blast and the alarm sounded by the watchman, and the people choose volitionally with their will to ignore the voice of the watchman, then they, uh, <clears throat> when they're slaughtered, uh, God says that he will not hold that watchman accountable for the blood of the people. So the question is that there have been countless watchmen that the Lord has raised up and some of them are secular watchmen, over the last 100 years. The train that is coming down the track of destruction and judgment and all kinds of things has been coming down the track for a long time, and anybody with any intelligence or perception or wisdom could see that this day that we're arriving in was due to arrive, and it has now arrived. And... The question is, up until now, there, there has been uh, limited responses, thank God, from a remnant who have chosen to, to hearken to the trumpet blast of the watchman and repent and call upon God. <clears throat> and we're thankful for that, because I believe that, that that has stayed judgment in our nation. I believe that the only reason our nation exists right now is because of that remnant of God's people who have heard the voice of the watchman and have obeyed his uh, voice and that trumpet, and they have gone to the Lord in repentance and prayer like the early pilgrims and Puritans. And I believe that the hand of God, to whatever degree, is still on America. But now we're entering a more serious phase, and God is raising up uh, watchmen across the nation, <clears throat> and they're raising the tempo of their voices. Uh, the sound of their warning is far more urgent because the, the situation is far more dangerous. And the question is, will the people of God heed the voice of the watchman that God raised up? And will they rouse themselves? Will they repent? And then will they take responsibility for what they're supposed to do individually? Because if they do repent and seek the Lord God, and if they do take responsibility for what they're supposed to do independently, then uh, God can hold back the judgment. He can send a biblical revival. And if the repentance and the crying out to God is... Uh, at a level that pleases a holy God, we could see a uh, biblical third uh, awakening, which would transform this nation by the power of God, at least among a remnant. But the remnant would be so infused with the power of God that it would uh, affect the outward society. I'm not saying the entire society is going to become Christian, but the remnant will be so uh, anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit, that they will impact the, the surrounding darkness with the power of God. And we could see a game changer in America. We could see freedom prolonged. We could see prosperity to whatever degree, uh, even if it's limited, restored. We could see uh, 
healing move in our nation. We could see the grace of God poured out on our government instead of it being handed over to gangsters and thieves. We could see an exposure of the globalist elite and God bringing some of them and their corruption into judgment. But this is all contingent upon God's people heeding the warning of the watchman and getting serious with God. So which will it be? That's my question to you. I'm Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. And my question to you is, which will it be? What will you do personally? What will you do personally? As David said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, I am doing everything I can. I have heeded the call to be a watchman, and I am a faithful watchman. And I can tell you why I'm a faithful watchman. Because I am willing to raise my voice up on various media, etc., and blow the trumpet, but most of all, to tell the truth about the situation and urge God's people to recognize what's going to happen, to recognize what their responsibility is, to repent, to seek the face of God so that judgment and destruction may be averted. That's what a faithful watchman does. And that's what God <clears throat> has called me to do, and that's what I do. That's why I've written 20 six books or whatever, 28 books, 29 books, and I do the DVDs, etc., etc., and speak where I speak. It's all for this reason. And this call, by the way, that I have to be a watchman began many, many years ago before I even understood that I had the call. God was formulating this in my mind. I'll give you an example. I was an independent feature film producer, and I came to Hollywood with my wife. She was an actress. This was, I don't know, 25, 26, 27 years ago. No, it was exactly, it was around 1981. So you do the math. Now, I remember distinctly uh, visiting some uh, Christian seminaries, large ones in Southern California, and being stunned at the, the confusion in the eyes of the students who looked bewildered. And I said to myself, well, whatever they're being taught isn't doing them any good because they don't look, uh, they don't look like they're, they're sharp. They don't look like they understand what's happening. They look confused and bewildered. And, and by the way, I didn't understand the theology that this particular seminary was dispensing, which was liberalism, which essentially deconstructs the Word of God. Of course you would be confused. And then I remember uh, we were shooting like uh, very low-budget documentary movies on video. And I was talking about, except for the Watchmen stuff, I was issuing a warning of uh, where our nation was going uh, if the present trends of apathy in the church uh, continued. You see, this, this was, was built into, into my DNA. This was built into my DNA before I got saved hitchhiking. But I didn't know it. You see, even though I was doing this, I didn't really get what I was doing. And so I was walking down the street near, it was either Sunset Boulevard or Hollywood Boulevard, and there was a pizza place, and in front of the pizza place there were like, I don't know, two dozen Harley-Davidson motorcycles and outlaw motorcycle uh, gang would eat pizza there, but, but the pizza was good. But anyway, on that particular street, I would look down this street, and I remember it as if it was yesterday. On the side of the street was a long, like, there used to be these outdoor magazine stands with hundreds of magazines and newspapers from all over the world. And I, as I walked by and had the video camera going, I would notice the large collection of uh, porno magazines were there, which to me represented the, the, the destruction and unwinding of the culture. But that, and then at the end of this block, where all the weird stuff was going on in Hollywood Boulevard, you know, there was this Baptist church, which, which wasn't giant, but it was large enough and that, that it, it actually, as you look down the street, it was like it seemed like it was in the middle of the street uh, because the street ended 
and ended at like the doorway of the Baptist church, which had columns and stuff like that. It was white. And I videotaped it. And I made the comment into the microphone that this was the, re I wasn't trying to be judgmental. I was simply trying to observe the obvious. And I said, this is why America is deteriorating. Because here was this church that had barricaded itself shut so it wouldn't be influenced by everything that was happening all around it. But in a sense, it was hiding. See, it had shut his doors and it decided to hide from the culture and disconnect from the culture. And that was really what I was commenting about. This is a long time ago, and I had no idea what I know now. But that is why we're in the place that we're in. And that was a very prophetic incident, even though I didn't know uh, why I was saying the things that I was saying. So, God has supernaturally called me to be a watchman. Now, uh, my question to you is, this message of warning has to be intelligently communicated um, with the consequences of not heeding the warning, along with the incredible possibilities of hope for God's supernatural blessing, God's supernatural defense, God's supernatural revival, God's supernatural third great awakening, his incredible power to deliver and protect and provide for you as a person and your family and your loved ones, along with the real data of what's going on. And so in order to do that, I use, God has called me to use a variety of means and technologies. So Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, we we hold local church meetings where we have uh, what we call prophecy and prayer meetings. So I will teach from the Word of God, but we'll also have a time where we'll pray uh, for our nation based on Second Chronicles 7.14. And uh, people will come from all over the place. And then uh, I teach and speak about this subject in the many books that I've written and conferences and uh, a film project that we have going. So I communicate this message to people all across the United States and across the world. But you see, the situation is becoming more, more urgent daily. And it doesn't take a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. I'm working on a new book now. You can see what's going to happen in America after this election, no matter who wins. There's heavy stuff coming. I really wish there wasn't, but there is it, it, heavy stuff is coming. And we need to call on God with the same fervency that the pilgrims and Puritans called on God as their source, capital S, so that God might send a powerful revival. So that God might send a powerful revival, like the revival of the Jesus movement in the 70s, where I got saved and millions of uh, young people got saved and uh, uh, churches were filled up in revival and uh, the Jesus movement made a significant difference in our nation and there were other revivals in our nation. We need that kind of revival now. Our young people need to be shaken with the power of God and the Spirit of God needs to be poured out upon our nation in, in a fresh way. Because if, if the Spirit of God is not poured out upon our nation in a fresh way, uh, we will not have freedom in our nation. Christianity will be illegal. Right now, because of the apathy of the church and the apathy of most Christians, piece by piece, increment, incremental step by incremental step, uh, Christianity and freedom of religion is being slowly removed from our nation. So we're blowing the trumpet <clears throat> and asking that God's people uh, respond to the warning as they are called to do. So I'm asking you to stand with me, first of all, in prayer. I need you to join with me in prayer, intercessory prayer. Pray, pray for our ministry. Pray for me. Pray for my family. Pray for our nation. Join us and others in a network of intercessory prayer warriors as a regular 
partner, uh, and intercessory prayer warrior. And join us as a prayer partner. Number two, we need those of you that will respond to the call of God and join us as a regular partner in your contributions and donations so that we can complete the television ministry, that we can expand the outreach, live stream the meetings, put the Paul McGuire report on television, live stream the Paradise Mountain Church meetings, and expand the radio outreach of the Paul McGuire report, and do these films that I've been discussing. We, we have a lot of plans that are pretty significant that I'm not ready to uh, release at the moment, but you'll be hearing about it, and they're going to reach millions of people. But we need people that will stand uh, up as partners for us financially with their uh, contributions and donations. And we need to complete our television studio and live stream uh, the Paradise Mountain Church meetings. And uh, you can find out about how we do all of this by going to paulmcguire.us. You can even donate, if you will, on paulmcguire.us. Uh, we have great specials on the books and the DVDs, like A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, and the four DVD set of the same title, if you choose. Plus, to learn about what's really going on, read a first book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, then Mass Awakening, and uh, invite people over for prayer and coffee, and get people educated, get them up to speed. And partner um, with this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church. We hold local Paradise Mountain Church meetings, and we have meetings coming up. And you need to go to the website at paulmcguire.us and find out when the next meeting is, where it will be held, and join us in prayer. You will be touched by the power of God. Because not only do I teach from the Word, but we pray together, and God pours out His Holy Spirit in these meetings in a powerful way. People are set free by the Spirit of God, and we come boldly to the throne of grace to find an ever-present help in time of need. And we, these are strictly non-political events, and we pray. Uh, we will be praying for the election both parties, and we're going to ask God for his supernatural intervention and his blessing upon our nation. But we need to expand this outreach to reach more people. You know, there's a lot of great Christian television, and I thank God for it, but there's a lot of Christian television, though it's like it's produced right out of the twilight zone. It, I don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about stuff that has nothing to do with reality. It's as if everything I just spent the opening part of this program sharing with you, they act as if it doesn't exist. And they know full well it exists because they have eyeballs and God has given them ears and they can hear and see on the media and look around them and see exactly what I see and you see and exactly what we see and hear. They can, they can perceive those, too, those things too, but they, they choose to live in la-la land. You know, that's what I used to say on the radio when I did the Paul McGuire show for 10 years on the radio in, Calif uh, in California. The nickname for California is La La Land because everybody is in La La Land. But the body of Christ is in La La Land because so much of Christian media, not all of it, there's some great stuff, but a lot of it is devoted to La La Land. It's, 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 it's in a little bubble that floats in, a, in, in unreality. God's not pleased with that. Unreality is non-reality. Non-reality is a lie. Lies are of Satan. The truth is of God. If you're embracing a disconnection from reality, listen to me. The majority of the Christian church in America is embracing a, a disconnect from reality. You know what that is in spiritual terms? They're embracing a lie at the most fundamental level. And a lie is not of the truth, and a lie is not of God. Satan is the father of lies. So they're embracing, by disconnecting from reality, from denying reality, they're embracing Satan's view of 
reality because Satan is the father of lies. That's not what God wants us to how God wants us to live. Jesus Christ said, "You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free." That's why we have to do these programs. Why I write the books. Why we need to do the television and the radio. Because what we're doing is we're presenting truth uh, to the body of Christ, truth to the culture. Now that may sound simple, and I, to be honest with you, I scratch my head all. I'll be very honest with you. I scratch my head all the time and say, why is it necessary? I mean, it's not a, re not a rebellious spirit. If I just say, why is it necessary for me to do this? I'm simply telling the truth. I mean, it's not like I'm doing something so phenomenal or unusual. I'm sim simply speaking the truth about what's going on. But you see, speaking the truth about what's going on is such a contradiction to the larger consensus of the denial of reality by Christians and many Christian ministries that you find yourself kind of like in the minority because whatever there it's not that we're better I'm not better than anybody this is about grace but I do uh, speak the truth you know uh, and, and that's what sets people free that's what Jesus Christ commanded us to do and, 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 you know, and, and I'm not the only one. God has raised up other ministries which do the same thing. So my question to you is, which side are you going to be on? Are you going to be the, on the side of God's truth and join in with those that proclaim the truth? See, preaching the gospel is proclaiming the truth. Being silent about the gospel is not proclaiming the truth. Let me, let me spell it out for you, and I know you, most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're so busy trying to be seeker-friendly that you fail to tell people that they're sinners, and because of their sins, they're eternally separated from God, and that they need, that they need a Savior, they need to ask God for forgiveness of their sins, they need to invite Jesus Christ into their life to be born again, and for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse them of all sin, what you're doing right there when you say that to people and you lead them in a prayer of salvation, is you're, one, you're being politically incorrect. You're telling them they're sinners, that they need a Savior. But you're being biblically correct, and it gives them an opportunity to come to Christ. And how do they come to Christ? Because you preach the gospel. And what is the preaching of the gospel? It's the communication of the truth of God's Word. And that sets people free. Now, if you choose to be seeker-friendly and you don't want to offend people, then you won't tell them they're sinners. You won't tell them they're in the uh, need of a Savior. And you won't tell them that they have to repent and receive Christ into their life. But you see, by not telling them that, you are uh, suppressing the truth in all unrighteousness, which is a lie. So we're all called to make a choice. Which side are we going to be on? Are we going to be on the side of God, the Holy Spirit, the truth of his word, are we going to be on the side of a lie, which is to join in? I mean, you know, you may not want to hear this, and I'm sorry, but it's the truth. If you're joining in on the side of a lie, then you are um, joining Lucifer as the god of this world and in, in, in stamping out the truth. See, so we're all, as, as people and as believers, we're all called to make a choice. Will we be on the side of truth, which is embodied in Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Or will we suppress the truth and be politically correct? Now, the pilgrims and Puritans enjoyed incredible economic prosperity social prosperity, and the blessing of God, because they chose to embrace the truth. In Deuteronomy 28, they chose to worship the real God as God, and they chose to hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, or the word of God, which was the truth. And as such, God blessed them, and all the blessings in Deuteronomy 28 were poured out upon them. And this is what I want to share with our church meetings, with our TV, with our radio, I want to issue, hopefully in an intelligent, articulate way, a challenge 
where we we really say to people, how long will you be divided between two opinions? How long are you, you going you gonna to play both sides? you got to make a choice. If you're God, then, then, then be with God. If you're going to be with Lucifer, then be with Lucifer, because we are in the last days, by the way. Whether they, you know, whether you want to make the, cho the choice to censor Bible prophecy, uh, you know, that's your prerogative, but remember that the book of Revelation says that by censoring Bible prophecy, you will be under a curse. No, are you going to speak the truth? Are you going to proclaim Jesus? Or are you going to deny the truth, deny Bible prophecy? Every see, believers need to make a choice. And the fate of our nation is contingent upon the choice that believers make. Will there be numerically a sufficient number or remnant of believers who, church, who choose to, 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 to serve Jesus as Lord and come to God boldly and cry out to God for revival for our nation? I believe that, that if, if a sufficient number of believers will do that. See, see, let me share what's on my heart that I believe the Holy Spirit put on my heart. <clears throat> If a sufficient number of believers cry out to God in repentance of their own personal sins, in repentance of the sins of the church, and ask God for a, a biblical revival or a third great awakening, I believe that no matter what happens in this political election, that God will pour out his spirit on the election, by the way. And that's important, that God pours out his spirit on the election. But God will also pour out his spirit after the election. And I believe that if God's people will stop playing church, which is a sin, by the way, and come boldly to the throne of grace to find an ever-present help in time of need, that if we call upon God passionately and fervently, <clears throat> and we ask God to supernaturally intervene in our nation, at the moment we ask um, in faith for Almighty God to supernaturally intervene in our nation, Almighty God, J Jesus Christ, will supernaturally intervene in our nation and he will change our nation's destiny. And God will, to whatever degree he chooses, <clears throat> pour out his Holy Spirit in revival, pour out his Spirit in a third great awakening, and I believe that you and I can live in a time where the power, the supernatural power of God is released upon America. Now, some of you may have no idea what that means. And I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you have to act like a lunatic, bark like a dog, foam your mouth, and roll around the floor like a lunatic. It doesn't mean that. It means that you are going to call upon God Almighty. And God Almighty is going to send his spirit into America, and God will purge and tear down the strongholds of wickedness in this nation. God will overturn the strongholds of wickedness in the, this nation. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. There will be a supernatural driving back of the powers of darkness on all levels of our society, as God's people come boldly to the throne of grace to find an ever-present help in a time of need. And as we call upon God in faith, a mustard seed of faith, we will call down the power of God, and it will shake this nation with a seismic force. It will shake the entrenched forces of wickedness, human sex trafficking, drug addiction, violence, political corruption, economic corruption. It will, sh it will shatter those strongholds in the name of Jesus Christ. God will pour out the spirit of truth. God will pour out his Holy Spirit. God will pour out to whatever degree a third great awakening. And the explosive power of that third great awakening that is released like a detonation in the fourth dimension or the invisible realm, which is really another way of saying the spiritual wor world. When, when the Bible describes the power of the Holy Spirit as the dunamis, the word dunamis means dynamite in, in terms of the explosive force 
of the power of God being released in the spiritual world and then with the resultant toppling of the strongholds. And not only that, you see, behind every earthly governmental, political, economic structure is an unseen uh, 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 spiritual structure. So that's why the apostle said, Paul said to you and me, the church, right now, and he's speaking to us. When, when I quote to you the scripture in Ephesians, we need to hear the Holy Spirit and be reminded that the apostle Paul spoke these words with an urgency for his time, and the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through uh, the Lord's word with an urgency for our time. And Paul wrote, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Then we're to pray always with all supplication in the Spirit. So there's the understanding that, that behind the wickedness and at all levels of our society, in the spiritual realm, it's almost like it's a holographic projection. There is the, we're not fighting against people. We're not, we're not fighting against human personalities. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the principalities and powers. These are high-level demonic forces. The dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. These are evil, uh, demonic spirits under the control of Lucifer. Lucifer, for our God, uh, for, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, against the dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And then Paul continues, you see, when we lay hold of God and repent and come boldly to the throne of grace, the sin that we've been carrying, which has blocked the power of God, is removed by the blood of Jesus. That's why in Revelation 12, it says regarding Lucifer and his conflict with the church, it says, for they, who's they? The church overcame him. Who's him? Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So in Revelation 12, the church is overcoming Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, because he's the accuser of the brethren who accuses the people of God day and night. You see, you don't have to get paralyzed spiritually and become fearful of going into the throne room of grace because you know that you have sin. You have the privilege of confessing that sin and being cleansed in the blood so you can come boldly into the throne of grace and be received by God as if you were pure and holy, which you are if you receive it by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So you go into the throne room of God. You cry out to God for your community, your marriage, your home, your church, the nation, the capital, and you got, ask God to supernaturally intervene, and God will send his dunamis power upon our nation with the force and the explosive force of dynamite. And guess what will happen? Something will happen which we have not seen, for the most part, none of us have seen in our lifetime. We may have tasted it of it if we were around the Jesus movement and other uh, revivals, but what will happen? is that as we call upon God and we do kingdom business, he will shake the satanic infrastructure, which is trying to grip this nation. And Satan is trying to destroy America right now. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Can, let me be as blunt and cogent, as simple and precise as I possibly can. Satan is trying to bring down America at this very moment. That's exactly what this entire conflict is all about. Satan is trying to bring down America at this moment because America is important to God, because America is a platform, however imperfect, for shining the light of Jesus, and it's a platform for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Satan is doing everything he can to try to take down America. But the only obstacle that Satan encounters in his attempt to take down America is the supernatural body of Christ, the supernatural church of Jesus Christ in this nation 
on, on this earth is what is blocking Satan from doing it. So Satan has been going over time trying to weaken, undermine the church, paralyze the church spiritually so he can push the church out of the way and, and accomplish his quest for domination and enslavement of America. Yes, that's what it's all about. If you strip it to its raw essence, that's what it's all about. That's why in this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, whether we like it or not, we are involved in a continual battle of prayer, crying out to God because we're fighting against principalities and powers and the dark unseen forces of wickedness that do not want us to expand this message through television, radio, social media outreaches, and other outreaches. We are in continual combat in the invisible realm with high-level principalities and powers. That's why I say to you who are sensitive to the Spirit of God, I need you to be my regular partner as an intercessory prayer warrior so that we can topple together these principalities and powers and move forward under the anointing of God and take the territory that God has given us to take. And what is that territory? It's to lay hold of, spiritually, America and drive the demonic powers off this nation. That's what it's about. But in order to do that, you have got to equip God's people through proper Bible teaching. You've got to equip God's people with proper biblical messages. You've got to equip God's people with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what we're doing on the Paul McGuire Report radio program. This is what we're doing at the Paradise Mountain Church meetings, which we want to live stream. This is what we're doing at the um, uh, television ministry, uh, the Paul McGuire Report television ministry. This is our spiritual thrust, and we need you to hear the summons of the Spirit of God and join in as a regular prayer warrior. We need you to hear the summons of the Spirit and to join in as a regular partner with your gifts and contributions and truly obey the Lord. And whatever God says to you to give, Give, because we're in an incredible spiritual battle, which requires financing to fight. Satan's trying to take down America. And so our effort is to educate God's people so that they can take their proper supernatural authority in Christ and drive the demonic powers from our land. You see, the message has to spread. The salt spreads. The light spreads. The church is called to be the light and the salt. Jesus said we're to occupy until he comes, or to do kingdom business until he comes. But that can only happen when God's people are taught the word of God, which we're teaching through this ministry in a, in a way which clears up the confusion, and they can see with laser-like pre precision that they're called for such a time as this that it's not hopeless, and that it is not the will of God for America to go down right now, and that we can um, take spiritual authority of, over different areas of our land and drive Satan off of America, and not only contest his right, he doesn't have any right, by the way, to destroy America. It's an illegal right he's assumed for himself by lying. But we can drive Satan and the demonic powers off of this nation. And you say, well, where's the biblical precedent for that? Well, for crying out loud, read your Bible. You want to know the biblical precedent? For crying out loud, open your deaf ears and read your Bible. Read the story. Read the story of the prophet Daniel when the children of God were in captivity. And he was there with the king of Babylon. And notice this, that Daniel uh, was not consumed with idle peripheral theological arguments. Daniel was on his knees before Almighty God, and he began his prayer because he was praying for his people who were in captivity. 
and he asked God to forgive him of his sins. And then Daniel confessed the sins of his people. And then Daniel cried out to God. And as Daniel repented and cried out to God on his knees, God was able to release two of his most powerful angels in the spiritual realm, the angel Michael and the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel came to Michael, and, excuse me, Gabriel came to Daniel and said that the territorial demonic spirits, the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, were moved out of the way from the moment that Daniel began to pray. But because Daniel really laid hold of God with personal uh, repentance, fasting, and intercession, that released God's most powerful angels to knock out the territorial spirits, the de demonic powers that were controlling the situation. And as a consequence, Daniel received a revelation, the 70 weeks of Daniel, a chronological time clock of prophecy of the last days. But God also, because of Daniel's prayer warfare that began on his knees, uh, enabled God's people to be free from captivity. Now, that's what we're encouraging people to do, to get on their hands and knees, to cry out to God, to repent of your own sins, to repent collectively, so that the captives are set free in America. There's tens of millions of people who are in that captivity in America to all kinds of things, spirits of witchcraft, Spirits of the occult, drug addiction, alcoholism, the religious spirits, all kinds of bondage. But God can break those shackles. God can break those chains when a third great awakening is poured out, when a biblical revival is poured out. But this is the critical moment. And I want you to hear me. You're listening to Paul McGuire and the Paul McGuire Report. You can send a link of this program to your friends all over the world or the nation by going to paulmcguire.us. You can hear the archives of this radio show at Blog Talk Radio. You can use iTunes or YouTube or Stitcher or SoundCloud or RSS feed or other uh, um, apps to play this program at your convenience and send it to your friends because by sending it to your friends, you're spreading revival. This is all about the fact that this election is just one manifestation, but there are many more of the intense spiritual battle we are in right now as a nation. And I have been called, as others have been called, to blow the trumpet as a watchman in the wall. And that's what I've been doing as you've listened to me talk on this program today of the Paul McGuire Report. I have blowed the shofar. I have blowed the trumpet in the prayer that God's people will rouse themselves before the enemy comes in and defeat the enemy and that they will be able to preserve their freedom and preserve this land and drive the demonic powers off America because America has a destiny in the last days a destiny that was established by the pilgrims and Puritans. And God is not finished with America yet. But you and I have a part to play. Together, if we will obey the Lord, we can change the destiny of this nation. And we, we will do that. That's what it's all about. We'll walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you a question again. Whose side are you on? Are you going to choose to be on the Lord's side or the side of yourself? Or are you going to worship the gods of personal peace and prosperity, which essentially means what you worship is your own convenience, your own uh, comfort. But if you repent of that, because that's idolatry. Deuteronomy 28 says you're going to be under a curse if you worship idols and worshiping your own convenience etc., is idolatry. Or you can choose to worship the true biblical God 
and that the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 will be poured out upon you and your family and all aspects of your life. You'll find that the supernatural power of God is released to protect you and your loved ones, and the angelic armies are released. You know, it's amazing to me. The Bible is very clear that God, we talk about the demons, and there are demons, the fallen angels, and there are fallen angels. But the Bible also says that God has angelic armies, vast numbers of angels who constitute the angelic armies of God. And when God's people stand in the gap and cry out to the Lord, the captain of hosts, the Lord Almighty will send his angelic armies in large numbers into the battlefield, the spiritual battlefields of America. And this will drive the demonic powers out of our nation. But it requires a confrontation with the, the spiritual powers of darkness. Now we can do this. This is doable. The very fact that we have a moment of freedom and a window of opportunity to discuss it on a program like this, and that so many of you can hear and listen, we can do this because what's behind this is the call of the Holy Spirit. And the call of the Holy Spirit is issuing a command to you. He's saying, rise. Rise. The Spirit of the Lord is commanding you to rise in faith. The Spirit of the Lord is commanding you to rise in obedience. The Spirit of the Lord is commanding you to rise and assume your position on, on the wall, the spiritual walls. And the Spirit of the Lord is commanding you to rise and take your position as a regular intercessor and a prayer warrior. And the Spirit of the Lord is commanding you to rise and take your position as a partner who regularly gives with their contributions and donations so that we can be released to present the message that God has given us to this nation, the nations and the earth, and to do it as effectively as possible with the uh, television ministry going forward and the radio ministry expanded, and the church meetings being live-streamed, and the teaching, and the books, and all the other resources we offer to people. The Spirit of the Lord is saying, rise. The Spirit of the Lord said to me, rise. And you may not feel perfect, and you probably certainly won't feel perfectly qualified, but by faith, you rise. And you accept the fact that it's you're qualified ultimately by the blood of Jesus because he, it is he who cleanses you of all sin. You don't qualify yourself with your own good works. You're qualified through grace. But you rise, and you were called for such a time as this. You were called before the foundation of the world. And you want to know, well, how come there's no oomph in your step? And how come you don't feel the presence of the Lord? And how come you don't seem to understand what your gifts and talents are? And you, you, you kind of wonder, well, why don't things seem to be falling in place? And why don't I seem to, to sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Guess what? All of that gets cleared up immediately when you make the decision to rise in obedience. You see, when you make the fundamental decision to rise in obedience to the call of God. All those other things are answered. You won't be walking around in a bewildered state anymore because you've chosen to rise in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you rise in the power of the Holy Spirit, God pours out his anointing upon you. And the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is released to be at work in your life and suddenly you have clarity of mind. Suddenly your spiritual and natural gifts begin to be released as they should be. Suddenly you know what your life's about. Suddenly you, it's, you don't, you're not walking around like you're confused anymore because you've been given the mind of Christ and all of a sudden you can sense for the first time the intimacy of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know that God is not distant anymore. The presence of the Holy Spirit surrounds you, and the presence of the Holy Spirit fills you, and you can literally 
drink in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the rivers of living water flow out of your inmost being. And as those rivers of living water flow out of your inmost being, not only do they replenish you, but the rivers of living water flowing out of your inmost being replenish those around you, replenish the people you're in contact with, and the anointing that it carries with it brings life. But it all starts with when you make that decision to respond to the command of the Lord when he says to you, rise, you make the decision by an act of faith to rise in the power of the Lord. And when you choose to rise in the power of the Lord, the anointing comes upon you. You're quickened by the supernatural power of God. You see, a lot of people are sitting on their posteriors and they're waiting on God. You've got it totally backwards. You've got it upside down. You're driving the car in reverse. You can sit there and drive your car in reverse all you want, but you're not going to get to where you want to go. You have to stop driving your car in reverse. You have to put it in drive. And by faith, when the Lord commands you to rise, which he's commanding you right now, the Lord is thundering in, from heaven and he's saying, rise. And you make that decision to rise by faith. The second you make the decision to rise by faith, there's a quickening of your inner man or woman. The anointing of the Lord comes upon you as you choose to rise. And as you choose to rise, the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, quickens you, you're energized from within, the rivers of living water flow out of your inmost being, and the anointing of God hits you, and the yokes of captivity are broken off of you. The bondages are lifted off of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you have single-mindedness. You no longer have fear. You have the peace of God. You're no longer, listen carefully to me, for, you're no longer wandering in the wilderness. You're now in the promised land. You're no longer wandering in the wilderness. You're now living in the promised land because you made that decision to rise when the Lord said, rise. And the Lord is saying to you right now, rise. And what did the Lord also say and the apostles say? They said, rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. Rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? You hear the voice of the Lord, rise. And with it, a promise. When you rise, you'll be healed in the name of Jesus. You want to know what it's like to have God take care of your business. You want to know what it's like for God to supernatural provide, to, to provide for you. It happens the moment you decide to rise. And as you rise and you obey the Lord and do what he's told you to do, then guess what? The Red Sea parts, the miracles happen, and you discover what being a Christian really means. You're filled with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope you were blessed by this program. My name is Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. And I pray that you would spread the fires of revival that were evident on today's program to your friends and those that need to hear it in the U.S. and around the world. Have them go to paulmcguire.us and... Uh, we have all kinds of apps where you can send them links on social media. Remember, God is not finished with America yet, and God is not finished with your life yet. And if you will rise, which many of you have, many of you, I thank God for all the people that rose today when they heard the word of the Lord. Let's, let's just finish today's program with a short prayer. And you can visit paulmcguire.us, by the way. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for every single person now, God, who when you commanded them to rise, they responded in obedience and they rose. And as they rose, Lord, your power, the power of your spirit came upon them, quickened them, anointed them, 
And they sense that anointing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a very dynamic way the second they responded to your command to rise, Lord. And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person who decided to rise and for those who still in the last seconds of this program are, de- are, are kind of debating or whether or not they're going to rise. I urge them, while God's grace is being poured out, You still have, in the last closing minutes and seconds of this program, an opportunity to rise. So, say to the Lord, I want to rise. And rise in the power of the Lord. And as you choose to rise, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So, I thank you for every person, Lord, who responded in obedience to your call, Lord. And let them be immersed in the presence of the Lord And I thank you for all those who have joined us in prayer and are partnering with us. I thank you for all those who are spreading the word. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that this is is the beginning of a revival that will sweep our nation. I thank you that this is the beginning of a biblical revival. I thank you this is the beginning of a biblical third great awakening, Lord. I thank you that as people rise in the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God quickening in them and upon them uh, transfers to the people around them. And revival is contagious and revival spreads, God. And I thank you, God, that you have defeated Satan and we have overcome him, the devil, by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And we are your victorious church. We are more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we rejoice in that fact, God. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that all the people who have asked you for something in prayer during today's program, as the anointing of God was ministering to many, I ask you, God, that as you were ministering to people, that all the people who lifted up a prayer towards you as they sense the atmosphere of faith expanding in their hearts, I pray, God, that you would show them quickly that you heard their prayer and that you would show them as a sign of what you did for them today. I pray that you would miraculously answer their prayer and encourage their hearts, God. And let no one leave this time, Lord, with any sadness or sorrow, let the spirit of mourning, the sorrow and sadness be removed from their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I pray that you were blessed by today's program. My name is Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. You can find out about our ministry at paulmcguire.us, and we have tons of free articles for you to read and all kinds of resources Spread the word of this program. You can hear it every Monday through Friday, um, two hours a day. And depending upon what time zone you're in, uh, you can find that time zone by going to paulmcguire.us. God bless you. Remember, Maranatha, Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. I'm Paul McGuire. God bless you.